I've got to speak to you. Let's understand each other. I'm tired of your phone calls. I've got nothing to say. Please, there are some things we've got to discuss. How is my wife? She wrote to you, she explained that... Oh, yes. The divorce. Yes. Well, the law's changed now. She can get a divorce anywhere after five years. I know, but we can establish that the marriage has broken down already. Please be reasonable. After five years, I can't stop you. In the meantime, you can go to hell. But we don't want to wait five years. We want to get married soon. Why? Oh, children, is that it? Well, they've got one little bastard already. One or two more to be going on with won't notice much. Oh, for God's sake, man. All right, so you couldn't father any children of your own. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about everything. Oh, get out of my way! Oh, get up. Oh, stop showing it. Get up! Well, lie there if you want to. They're not hurt. What's wrong? So then I dialed 999. But when the ambulance arrived, this police car stopped outside Mr. Fletcher's house to see what was on. Do you know Mr. Fletcher? Deliver letters there every day. Mr. Harold Fletcher. Go on. Well, Mr. Fletcher drove past me. And when I went into the garden, there he was, lying there. This fella. Uh, Dr. Hardy, good morning, sir. We've got a man found dead, no apparent cause of death. Yes, if he was, a uh, Driving license on the body. Not been confirmed yet, but I believe his name is Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson, sir. His address. Why, do you know the man, Doctor? Well, was Mrs. Fletcher there this morning? Well, I took it they were still away. They? Her and the baby. Always used to see the pram in the front garden. Until when? Oh, about three or four weeks ago, I suppose. Do you know where she might have gone? No. Well, I took it they were away on holiday or something. I have to do a post-mortem. All right, darling, I'll see you later. A post-mortem on a man called Michael Jackson. Not the same Michael Jackson. But from the address, I should say so. I have told Fleming, of course. Well, why? How? What happened? I don't know. Uh, yes, all right, I, I, I'll hold on. Well, does Ruth Fletcher know? Has she been told? Police are going there now. Mr. Michael Jackson live here? Yes, but he's out at the moment. Can I help? You are? I'm his wife. I'm from the police. Oh. Won't you come in? Thank you. My name is Ash. Yes? Detective Sergeant Ash. I took it you were Mrs. Fletcher. Mrs. Ruth Fletcher. Oh. Well, yes. Um... I don't know what made me say that, really, except when people call, it always seems easier. But um, how... Well, what do you want? Why are you here? I have to tell you that Mr. Michael Jackson was found dead this morning. Dead? Yes, I'm sorry. Michael. You'd better sit down. Oh. 
What happened? Was it an accident? We don't know what happened yet. Sergeant, would you excuse me a moment? Uh, uh, would you mind waiting? I won't wait Of course, Mrs. Fletcher, could you tell me where we can contact your husband, please? Harry? Well, what's Harry got to do with it? Uh, we'd like to speak to him, that's all. Where does he work? You say you noticed the two men together? That's right. I saw them talking in his front garden. Mr. Fletcher's place. And what happened next? Well, I don't know. I was delivering another lot of letters. The next thing I saw was Mr. Fletcher driving off. Did he speak to you? I don't think he even saw me. You know, the old postman. He's invisible, isn't he? And then? Well, then I cycled up the drive and there he was. This fella, lying on the ground. Oh, I see. No, oh, never mind, thank you. Better now. Yes, thank you. Light? Thank you. Ash, Inspector Fleming's office. Oh, well, uh, we better take a message for him. Make sure that he gets it. Mr. Fletcher is a sales manager at Franklin's. He went to the office this morning, and then he went out. They don't know where. He may go for lunch at the Mandrake restaurant. Otherwise, he can be found at his office again around about four. About four. All right? Mrs. Fletcher, do you know where Mr. Jackson was going this morning? Well, he, yes, he was going to try and see my husband. We, we wanted a divorce, and my husband was being rather difficult, so... Michael was going to try and catch him at home. And does Mr. Jackson have any relatives living nearby? No. No, he was an only child. Both his parents are dead. No, there are no relatives. Except for his son. I see. The baby's... Not my husband's. Michael's. Mrs. Fletcher, I'm afraid we need someone who can formally identify the body. Uh, yes. Do you have anybody you can leave the baby with? Uh, well, yes, there's a neighbour. She's, uh, she's been very kind. Michael, Michael and I both like to have Thank you. And after I that, I shall need to take a statement from you. Further. A bit more. That's about it. We're standing this far apart? I think so. Did you see if either man was carrying anything? No. Except for Mr. Fletcher's umbrella, of course. He always carried a rolled umbrella. Nothing else? No. External examination. Head. No cuts, abrasions. No sign of any injury indicating a fall or any other kind of injury. Face again. No visible injuries. Throat and neck. No sign of pressure. Linear contusion. Right hand side. Approximately eight centimeters in length. What do you think caused that, Doctor? Fingernail, perhaps? How on earth should I know? Our shoulders and arms. Yep, no sign of any injury, but... Uh, right hand side. Bruise. Just below the costume margin. Approximately two centimeters in diameter. Perhaps he just died of a heart attack. Or something. In that case, why did Fletcher walk away? Drive off and leave him lying on the ground? Or something. That was three weeks ago. And you left your husband and went to live with Mr. Jackson? Yes. And that was after you'd established by the means of blood tests that the baby's father was Mr. Jackson and not your husband? Yes. When your husband first knew of your relationship with Mr. Jackson, do you know what happened? Yes. My husband hit Michael. 
Were you there? Yes. Did you hear what was said? Yes, I heard. Mrs. Fletcher's statement, sir. She says that on one occasion she heard her husband threaten the dead man. Oh, did she? My husband lost his temper and slapped Michael's face. She called him violently and said, if there was a word of truth in this, I ought to kill you. Here and now. Where is she? She wasn't feeling too good, so I sent her home. Well, there's no luck from the PM. I'm going for a drink. He should help you to sleep tonight. And I'll come round and see you again in the morning. Thank you, Doctor. This flat is full of Michael. If he'd just gone out and he'd be back later. It's like him, this place. Quiet, tidy, pleasant. It's a very warm, bright room, don't you think? That's because the windows face south. Yes. I used to tell him I felt like a visitor here. Half joking, you know. Now I feel like an intruder. It might be best if you went to stay with a friend or some relative. No, it's, it's all right, Doctor. I'll work something out. Don't worry. And thank you very much. You've been very kind. I was really feeling quite unwell. Reaction, I suppose. I'm beginning to realize. Really realize. Yes, I know. Poor Michael. Poor me is what I really mean, I suppose. What caused his death, Doctor? I don't know. Well, he wasn't ill. As far as I know, he was perfectly well. Why should a detective ask me questions? Well, when someone dies, that death has to be accounted for. Once Harry agreed to a divorce, we were going to be married in the registry office. Then we were going to have another baby. To keep David company. We liked being together. It was affection and kindness. I believe he would have been happy. I, I believe he would. Agreed. It's most unusual. I'll let you have the report about an hour and a half. Goodbye. Well, uh, done. Yes, it's already been decided. Well, if you don't mind putting off your lunch, I'd be glad if you would get a copy down to the coroner's office straight away, and also a copy to the inspector family. Yes. Mario didn't give me your name. Uh, Fleming. I'm from the police. Oh? Hey, let's sit down, shall we? Will you have a drink, uh, Inspector? Chief Inspector. I've got one. Uh, brandy. One. Yes. Uh, no, thank you. Well, what can I do for you? Do you know a man called Michael Jackson? Slightly. When was the last time you saw him, Mr. Fletcher? Well, why do you ask? Because I'd like to know. On my bow. So you last saw him when? This morning. Where was that? At my house. Indoors? In the front garden. We talked there. You just talked? Yes. What about? A private matter. You're on good terms with Mr. Jackson? Not especially. Look, I'd like to know why you're asking me these questions. I tried to contact you through your office, but they seemed a bit vague as to where you were. Well, my job is selling, not sitting in an office. So you had a conversation with Mr. Jackson on a private matter. And then what? I left. And when you left, was he all right? 
Yes. yes. Did you hit him at all? Well, no, of course not. Any kind of violence take place? No. Look, Inspector. I just want to be absolutely clear about this. When you left Mr. Jackson, was he standing up? Standing up? On his feet? Yes. He was on the ground? No. No kind of violence took place? No. You see? Look, I don't know why you're asking me these questions, but I think I've got a right to know. Well, as a matter of fact, Mr. Fletcher, I was hoping that what you told me now might help us with our inquiries as to how Michael Jackson came to be found dead in your front garden immediately after you left for work. Dead? Yes. Well, he can't be dead. I'm afraid he is. You can't offer any possible explanation. No. Some illness? That's what it must have been. Something sudden? That's possible, Mr. Fletcher. I shall want a statement, of course, so if you wouldn't mind coming down to the police station. Oh, hello, Doctor. Doctor Hardy, this is Mr. Fletcher. Yes, we Mr. have met. Oh, good afternoon. Well, if you finish with me now, Inspector. If you wouldn't mind waiting a few more minutes, Mr. Fletcher, while I check your statement. Uh, Frank, would yes. you show Mr. Fletcher to the interview room, please? Thank you. Miss Waiter. I mean, I did inform you that I have been consulted professionally by Mr. Fletcher. Yes, I know, sir, but he hasn't mentioned it, and uh, neither have I yet. Yet? I haven't quite finished with him, Doctor. Depends on your report, Mr. Well, you'll have it within the hour. Hmm. See, according to his statement, when he left Jackson, he was alive, well, and standing on his own two feet. I see. <clears throat> Whereas, according to our information, he left a man who was already dead or dying. Dead, in my opinion. Now, what caused his death, Doctor? You remember that slight abrasion on the side of the neck? Yes. But in my opinion, whatever caused that abrasion, brought pressure to bear on the vagus nerve, which is just about there. And that was sufficient to kill him? It was sufficient to cause the death of any man. Any man? There's no uh, suggestion of any weird illness or condition. No. Well, how do you suppose it happened, Doctor? Hounds around the throat in an attempt to throttle Jackson? No indication of that. Well, Fletcher denies striking Jackson. Ah. But suppose he did hit him with something. Something that might have caused that abrasion. Would that do it? Yes. Yes, possibly. I mean, was he carrying anything that might have served as a weapon? A rolled umbrella apparently always carries one. Couldn't a metal ferrule from an umbrella? Conceivably. Well, suppose you were to submit it to laboratory examination, this umbrella. Could you find any traces of skin or anything? Well, nothing's impossible. I should regard it as most unlikely. And if he taps his umbrella on the street as he walks along... Well, it may not be necessary. What about this bruise on the side that was caused by kicking, would you say? Well, it's possible, but it's quite irrelevant in this case. Because to find a bruise the post-mortem means it must have been caused some time before death. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Fletcher. I must say, Inspector, I do have work to do. There are certain ambiguities in your statement I'd like to clear up by means of further questions. Ambiguities? What ambiguities? I must now also warn you that I have reason to believe that you caused Michael Jackson's death. You're not obliged to say anything unless you wish to do so. Whatever you say may be put into writing and given in evidence. I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't cause his death. You said in your statement that when you left Michael Jackson, he was alive and unhurt. Well, he was. We have reason to believe that when you left him, he was dead and on the ground. No. Do you deny that you struck Jackson? Yes. Did you quarrel with Jackson? No. Your wife had left you and gone to live with Jackson. That was shortly after you found out that her child was not yours, but Jackson's. Jackson had come to see you to ask you to divorce your wife. I ask you again, did you quarrel with Jackson? Oh, for God's sake, you wouldn't expect me to be friendly with Did you strike Jackson? No. Then why was he on the ground? I don't know. Did he just fall? Well, yes. That's how it was. He, he just sort of collapsed. Do you walk away from him? I thought he was shamming. 
Shamming what? I... I don't know. But you left him. You didn't stop to see if he needed any help. If there was anything you could do. Well, I told you I thought he was pretending. Did you kick him as he lay on the ground? No. There was a bruise on the body, on the lower ribs. How do you suppose he got that? Well, I may have shoved him with the toe of my shoe to try and make him get up. All right, so now we know that you quarreled with Jackson, that he fell to the ground, that you kicked him as he lay on the ground, and then you left. Now, why did he fall to the ground? I swear to God, I didn't touch him. No, perhaps you didn't touch him, but did you strike him with anything? Your umbrella, for instance? No. There was an abrasion on Jackson's neck. I think that was caused by the metal ferrule of this umbrella. I think you lost your temper with Jackson, lashed out. And the tip of the umbrella caught him on the neck. We can submit this umbrella to forensic examination, if you like. If you persist in denying that you struck him, we'll see what we can find on this umbrella in the labs. Sergeant. Huh? Give this to Dr. Hardy for forensic examination. No, no, it's all right. Do you admit now that you did strike Jackson? I didn't mean to hurt him. You wish to make a fresh statement? Yes. I want my solicitor. Before I make another statement, I want my solicitor here. He's been charged with murder. Yes. I should be called for the prosecution, of course, and I expect you will too. Me? I have you forgotten that little episode in the hall when you showed him out? Oh, yes. Inspector Fleming asked me about that. That could be interpreted as a threat. I can't say I like being cross-examined much. Oh, it's not so bad, really. That's all right for you. You enjoy it. Well, the expert witness must exude a certain air of confidence. Arrogance. Learning. To the point of pomposity. But I'm never pompous. <laughs> I'm jealous, really. You never seem to get flustered. If I got flustered, I might cast doubt upon the evidence I was giving murder. That means life imprisonment if he's found guilty, doesn't it? Automatically. I must say, I never thought he'd be charged with murder. He struck a man. And as a result of that blow, the man died. But don't they have to prove intent? Well, intent to cause grievous bodily harm, yes, but not necessarily death. With a certain implied malice, but that doesn't mean planning. Oh, the question now is, did Fletcher intend to cause grievous bodily harm to Michael Jackson. That is what the jury will have to decide. Come here, Mrs. Fletcher. Sit down, will you? Thank you. Now, what can I do for you? Well, I, I wanted to ask if I would have to give evidence against my husband. Uh, no, you can't. I can't? You're not a competent witness for the Crown in a case of this kind. I see. You're free to give evidence to the defence, of course. The defense? Yes, that's up to you. Oh. You see, I asked Michael to go and see Harry. I'd written to my husband, pleading with him for a divorce. He wrote back a horrible letter. It's awful, obscene. And you still have the letter? Oh, no, I, I destroyed it. I didn't want to upset Michael. And then Michael telephoned him several times, but it was no good. If only I'd waited. You see, I'm really very conventional. I wanted to be married to Michael. So you see, in a way, it was my fault. But give evidence for the defense. No, I couldn't do that. Well, you must decide that for yourself, Mrs. Fletcher. All I can tell you is it's impossible for you to be called by the Crown. What are the chances? Oh, from the excellent brief which Mr. Fisher has prepared, I don't think we need be unduly pessimistic. Oh, what about my wife? I did everything possible for her. If Mr. Fisher has interviewed Mrs. Fletcher. I doubt if what she would say would be helpful. Oh, well, and I still think we ought to find another pathologist. It all hangs on Hart's evidence. 
What we need is some expert who'll go into the box and contradict him, swear that he's wrong. I doubt if he is wrong, Mr. Fletcher. No, we shall admit the basic facts, as it were, in all honesty. <laughs> Marvellous! You say that I killed him? Not quite. Mr. Denton, I stand to get ten years in prison at least. The line I shall follow is this. First, that you had no intention to commit grievous bodily harm, let alone death. I hadn't. But we have to account for the fact that you did strike him. I should like to be able to establish provocation rather more satisfactorily. Oh, good God Almighty, you've read all this. What more do you want? I've had weeks of provocation. Uh, provocation in this sense means provocation at the time. Some action, some phrase used, which could reasonably be regarded as provoking an ordinary man to a momentary act of violence and which actually provoked the accused. I could say that he pushed me. Is that what you mean? I'm certainly not asking you to invent anything, Mr. Fletcher. Now, let us try again. Why did you strike Michael Jackson? I lost my temper. Yes, but why did you lose your temper? Why, at that precise moment, did you lose control? Well, he asked me for a divorce. I said no. Yes. And then he said, go on. I don't know if this is the sort of thing you mean. What did he say then, Mr. Fletcher? This statement is true. I have made it of my own free will. Dated and signed, Harold Fletcher. Were you present when the accused made those two statements you have read to the court? I was, sir. Also present when the second statement was made was his solicitor. Uh, Chief Inspector, uh, does the main point of difference between the two statements concern the nature of the quarrel which took place? I would say, my lord, the main points of difference are in his first statement, the accused stated he did not hit the deceased, and that when he left, the deceased was standing upright. In his second statement, the accused admitted hitting the deceased, he admitted kicking him as he lay on the ground, and he admitted leaving him lying on the ground. Thank you. What took place then? The accused was then charged. Asked if he wished to say anything in reply to the charge, he said nothing. Thank you. Inspector, was the second statement made by the accused consistent with the known facts? Yes, sir. Was it a full and frank statement? It was consistent with the known facts. In your experience, is it uncommon for a hitherto honest and respectable man to lie when he is caught up in events beyond his normal experience? It does happen. And is it not so that a man in this position reacts instinctively rather than rationally? That depends. Who's next? I am. Suppose you're very busy today. You'll be leaving then, will you? Would you like me to stay in court while you're giving your evidence? Would you mind? Not at all. You know, sometimes you really are a nice, thoughtful man. No, it's no trouble. I'd intended to stay in court anyway for this trial. Professor Hardy, to simplify matters for the jury, will you explain what you mean when you refer to the consequences of pressure on the carotid body. <coughs> yeah. The uh, carotid body, or plexus, is a circumscribed network of vital nerves, including the vagus nerve, on both sides of the neck. Um, would uh, this be of any assistance? Uh, would your lordship care to look at this drawing? I should. The vagus nerve can play an important part in breathing, the action of the heart. In what way? The pressure brought to bear upon either one or both of these vital areas can bring life swiftly to a close. And this is known in medical terms as a vasovagal envision of the heart. Did you find any evidence of impact which might have caused this pressure on the carotid body? I found uh, an abrasion approximately three inches in length over the region of the carotid body. Can you give us some examples as to what actions could have brought this about? A pressure of fingers over the vital area, a blow on the side of the neck, a prod with a fence's foil, and the like. 
You have stated that, in your opinion, this abrasion was consistent with a blow from the metal ferrule of the umbrella, Exhibit A. I have. And that could lead to fatal results? It could. Could such a blow have killed any man, or was the deceased suffering from any condition which made him peculiarly susceptible to such a blow? He was not. Such a blow could have caused the death of any man. Professor Hardy, what, in your view, was responsible for the death of the deceased? A blow such as I have described. Thank you. Professor Hardy, I am credibly informed that you are a pathologist of wide experience. I am led to believe so. Have you come across cases where death has been caused in this manner before? I have. Frequently? No. In your experience, it is a rare cause of death? Yes. You have said that a prod with a fencing foil could bring this about. I have. Can you call any other examples to mind? Boxing. In what respect? The fatalities in the boxing ring, the blows fall on the lateral region of the neck. Without any other explanation of the catastrophe? That is so. But due, in fact, to pressure on the uh, carotid body? Yes. Is it not true that death caused in this manner is invariably accidental? No. Uh, let me put my question in another way. If one man intended to bring about the death of another man, would he be likely to do so by aiming a blow at the carotid body, assuming he had sufficient medical knowledge to be aware of its existence? I would regard that as extremely unlikely. Uh, why? Because the area where pressure has to be brought to bear is extremely small and pressure has to be brought to bear on that exact point. Am I then right that the conclusion you have reached is based on probabilities only? No. The conclusion I have reached is based on more than probability, in my experienced opinion. Realizing that you are accustomed to answering hypothetical questions, I just wanted to know how far you would go. I suggest to you that you have been wrong in this case and that what you have been dealing with is a straightforward one of syncope or sudden heart failure from purely natural causes. No, the conclusion I've been forced to reach is based upon a serious and careful consideration of the detailed circumstances and the pathological findings of the case. The heart is doing a grand job. Is it? Hmm. Have the sport, Perch. Who were the parties concerned in these blood tests? <coughs> Michael Jackson, the deceased, Mrs. Ruth Fletcher, and Mrs. Fletcher's baby, David. And what was the result of those tests? That Michael Jackson could be the father of the child. Subsequently, did Mr. Fletcher consent to a blood test? Yes. And what was the result of that test? Uh, that Mr. Fletcher could not be the father of the baby. Was Mr. Fletcher informed of this result in your presence? Yes. Did the accused say anything subsequent to this occasion, which you recall in particular? Yes. Where was that? In my hall. I was showing him out. And what did he say? Well, he had become very angry, and I was trying to calm him down. Yes, but what did he say, Doctor? I'll kill him before I let him get away with this. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Hardy, during this interview at which you were present, how did the accused receive the news that he was not the father of the child? What was his man? He was very upset, first of all. He found it hard to believe. Why did he find it hard to believe? I am not well acquainted with the accused, and he is not one of my patients. You were present when the accused was told he was not the father of the child. You observed his behavior. Uh, was he deeply distressed? Yes. To the point of actually issuing a threat? Yes. Uh, did you report this threat to the police? No. Why not? I didn't take it seriously. Did you think the threat was an idle one? At that time, yes. Would such a man, after many years of childless marriage, be susceptible, more than usually susceptible, to slurs on his virility? In my opinion, yes. Would you care to elaborate on your reasons for saying that? My lord, I must object. Finish the case for the Crown. Hmm? The old boy has decided to adjourn. 
Thank you. I thought you did very well. What about Cornouille? Oh, no, no thanks. You know, it's fascinating watching a murder case. <laughs> it's like a game of chess. After a time, you can see the pattern quite clearly. I can't. Well, that reduces the tactics to the fence and are quite clear. First of all, A tried to establish it was an accident. Now, it's provocation. Well, how will they do that? Oh, well, of course, exactly what form of provocation will take, I don't know. But you must forget that the defence know perfectly well that they are dealing with a jury consisting of 12 very ordinary men with a set of 12 very ordinary prejudices. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if at the end of the... Have you decided yet? No. What is your name? Harold Fletcher. Where do you live? The Gables Ashtree Road. How long have you lived there? About seven years. What type of house is it? Detached, four bedrooms, dining room, sitting room, in about a quarter of an acre. Who chose that? My wife. We looked at several, but it was the one she liked best. Was your marriage a happy one? I thought so. We had our ups and downs, but everybody does. Did you ever suspect your wife of associating with another man? No, never. I trusted her implicitly. Did you give your wife an allowance? I paid in a fixed sum every month so that she could buy clothes, perfume, makeup, anything she wanted. Without having to ask? That was the idea. How long have you been married? Fifteen years. When did you first meet the deceased Michael Jackson? About two and a half years ago. In what circumstances? Well, he came to sell me some insurance. I told him I wasn't interested, but he persisted. In the end, I had to ask him to stop being a nuisance. When he called at your house, were you always present? No. I realize now that his calls are really an excuse to see my wife. Did you subsequently discover the nature of the relationship between the deceased and your wife? Yes. What was that relationship? My lord, I must object. My learned friend's questions bears no relation to the alleged murder. The Lord, I am entitled to establish the relationships between the principals in this matter. You may continue, Mr. Denton. I was afraid of this. Mr. Fletcher? A sexual relationship. They were committing adultery. Who told you this? They did. The deceased and my wife. Not them. A few weeks ago. Do you know when the adultery between the deceased and your wife began? Well, they told me it had been going on for just over two years. Just over two years. Did you go away on holiday two years ago? Yes. Where did you go and with whom? To Greece, with my wife. Were you happy together? <laughs> Seemed so to me. I did notice she wrote a lot of letters. I thought they were to friends of hers. I realized later that they were really love letters to Michael Jackson. Did your wife continue to reside under your roof while committing adultery with the deceased? For just over two years until she finally left, yes. Did you continue to have relations with her during that time? Yes, regularly. Did she ever indicate that she was unwilling? Ruth was never unwilling. Mr. Fletcher, have you ever been unfaithful to your wife? No, never. I was never interested in any woman except Ruth. Where was your wife's baby born? Redlands Nursing Home. That is a private nursing home? Yes. Cost the earth. Who paid the bill? I did. I thought it was my child. Did your wife ever indicate that the child might, after all, not be yours? No, no. Did you want a child? Very much. What was your attitude when the child was born? I was... very pleased. This was before you discovered that the child was not yours? Yes. When your wife left you and went to live with the deceased, did you want a divorce? No. Why not? I hoped she'd come back to me in due course. What about the child? I'd have taken him as well. True, you wouldn't. You wouldn't do that. We have heard of the threats made against Michael Jackson. Did you mean those threats? 
but not literally, no. What were your feelings towards him? I didn't much like him. Mr. Fletcher, you must be absolutely honest with the court. Did your feelings go further than that? Yes. I hated him. He took my wife, the child I thought was mine. Yes, I did. Hate him. Did you intend to kill him? No. Did you intend to cause him grievous bodily harm? No. Yet you did strike him? Yes. With what? My umbrella. Tell the court how that came about. Well, he came to ask me to agree to a divorce, but I refused. He persisted, so I asked him to go. He kept on arguing. I lost my temper and sort of slashed at him with my umbrella. And he fell to the ground. But I realize now what had happened, but at the time, I thought he was shamming. I shoved him with the toe of my shoe to try and make him get up. But he wouldn't. So I left him. What made you lose your temper? Something he said. What was that? Tell the court, please. Well, when I refused to agree to a divorce, he said, for God's sake, man, just because you're impotent doesn't mean everybody else is. If she's no use to you, let her go. Were those the exact words used? Yes. At what stage did you lose your temper? When he said that. When the deceased said, uh, repeat the words, please. For God's sake, man, just because you're impotent doesn't mean everybody else is. She's no use to you. Let her go. That's not true. Michael would never say a thing like that. It wasn't in you. Were you there when Denton helped Fletcher carve his wife up in such small pieces? Part of the time, it's all male jury. Yes. She seemed to me to be a nice woman. Yeah, she probably is. How would you like a tart like that for a wife? That's what he was saying then. Whether she's a nice woman or not, it won't stop it to be said again, I'll bet. You'd better sit down. It wasn't like that. It wasn't like that at all. They made it so. I love my... I know. It's all lies. It wasn't like the truth at all. I think it would be best if you went home. No. No, I'm all right now. I'm going back. I really don't think you should. I may as well hear the rest. It can't be any worse. And when considering the failure on the part of the crime to establish intending to commit grievous bodily harm, and the provocation which I have touched upon, consider also the position in which the accused find himself. Married for 15 years, he had always provided for his wife in every way. The home she wanted, a personal al allowance, holidays abroad in pleasant places, she lacked no consideration. In return, you might think a man would be entitled to expect at least loyalty. But what happened? His wife became attracted to an insurance salesman who had insinuated himself into their home and committed adultery with this man regularly over two years while yet enjoying the benefits which her husband faithfully provided. My learned friend has referred to this liaison as a love affair. But this woman was never honest with her husband. She deceived him without scruple. I would submit to you that to attach the word love is merely an attempt to dignify a sly and sordid affair. Finally, when the husband had cared for his wife during her pregnancy and had begun to make plans for the future as he thought, their son, he was told by his wife and the deceased that he must take a blood test. Why? So that they could have proof positive that the child was not, after all, his, with which the wife departed to live with the deceased. 
How would any ordinary man feel under the circumstances? How would you feel, gentlemen of the jury? There you are. Congratulations. And you do. And you do. Yes, indeed. Now, where are you next? A Bristol, a fraud case. Horribly complicated. How about you? <laughs> Rather an interesting libel. Damages should be enormous. Pity you're not in the percentage. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. Right, let's go to some work then, shall we? What a waste of time. Do you think that not guilty was a fair verdict? Well, it's a verdict. Fletcher could say anything he liked. Truth, half truth, and downright lies. She couldn't even answer back. I always thought that a wife wasn't compelled to give evidence against her husband, but that she could if she wanted to. In certain cases, yes. Certain crimes, but in the case of murder, she is definitely not allowed to give evidence against her husband. So someone can say anything at all against her, as Fletcher did, and she can't disprove it. Well, uh, some authorities do think that the law needs reform in this matter. Oh, I should think so. One distinguished barrister of my acquaintance has gone so far as to say that in his opinion. Just a minute. I'm in a hurry. I have to take baby to the nursery and get to work. Are you working now? Yes. I wanted to get in touch with you after the trial. And somehow I couldn't. There was no other way, Ruth. They were going to take ten years of my life. You took quite a lot away from me, Harry. Excuse me. <laughs> 